morning, Lost City, and welcome to our Sunday gathering as we continue to gather via Lost City at home, basically, as we gather in our homes and um, worship Jesus as we w- watch over a digital stream. Again, let me remind you, you are not watching a service this morning. You are part of the service. So when we sing, sing loud. When we read the passages together, read it loud together. Sing um, as you hear the sermon process and um, make sure um, that you are interacting and connecting. Take advantage of the comment box below. Let us know you're here. Share prayer requests. Maybe share a scripture portion that has encouraged you this week. But let's be the body. Even as we cannot gather together in a single location, we can still find ways to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to lift each other up. So take advantage of the comment box below. Connect, encourage, um, and let's, let's worship Jesus together this morning as we continue to gather in this way. Friend, if you're new and you're trying to figure out if Loft City is where God is calling you to be, can I invite you to text the word LOFT, L-O-F-T, to 33777, LOFT to 33777, and we'd love to share with you some of our practices, some of our beliefs, some of the things that make us unique as a church body. And if God is calling you here, this gives you a little bit more information to help you figure out if this is where God is calling you to be. I know personally that trying to find a home church is one of the hardest decisions to make. You want to know that you belong and you fit and what the church is teaching is important. And so we pray for you as you discern that. And we're grateful that you are watching our video this morning. So thank you. Hey, church body, we want to check in on you and make sure you're doing well. Take a moment to um, text the number below so that we could do our weekly check-in and see how we can be praying for you, especially in seasons like this when it's hard and it's difficult. We as leaders need to know how well we can be caring for you, how well we can be encouraging you. And so if you would take a moment and fill out, um, do the survey so that we know how you're doing and how best we can care for you in this season. By the way, if you have prayer requests this morning, would you take a moment and email them to prayer at loftcitychurch.com? prayer at loftcitychurch.com, or you can text or call anytime during the service. You can text or call 214-233-5638, 214-233-5638. Um, feel free to text. We'd love to be praying for you and knowing how we can be praying for you in this season. If you haven't downloaded the worship guide already, take a moment, download the worship guide. We would love to for you to follow along in our worship this morning. The songs are there. The sermon notes should be there. Prayer, uh, um, ways that we could be praying are in there. And so all the ways that we could connect with Zoom um, during the week are all in there. So download the worship guide, follow along in our service, sing along. Like I said earlier, as we sing, sing with us. Sing as if um, you truly believe that Jesus is King of all and L- L- King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, as we gather, uh, we need to be reminded in this season of God's goodness and God's kindness and God's grace to us. And so what I want to do as we begin is I want us to read Colossians 1 verses 15 down through verses um, 22 um, together. The words are going to be shown on the screen. Can I invite you? Um, As you see these words, read them aloud with me. Join me as we read God's word. And then as as soon as I'm done, um, why don't you take a moment and meditate on what you've heard and be reminded of God's goodness and God's grace that's showed to us through Jesus. And so Colossians 1, 15 down and on down. So Colossians 1 is 15.
Why don't you take a moment before we begin and meditate on Jesus' goodness, on Jesus' grace, on his kindness. Why don't you spend some time thanking him for that? And then we'll begin our service this morning. Let's worship Jesus together as we sing, as we celebrate, as we worship the King of kings and Lord of lords.
Good morning, kids. This morning we are talking about promises, stars, and Father Abraham. If you haven't already, go check out our Kids Church video with your parents this morning. We've got a craft for you guys to work on and some discussion questions for y'all to go through. And as always, we hope to see you on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock for our Kids Church Zoom. We'll be playing another round of Guess the Surprise Guest, so you don't want to miss it. We will see you soon. Family, it's time for us to be able to worship through our giving. We just sang um, in worship, and now we have the opportunity to give in worship. When you give this morning, we... Um, we give not to get something from God. We don't give because we're manipulating God and saying, God, here's my $10, now you need to give me $100 back or anything like that. We give because He has already given exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think. And so can I invite you to give generously to Jesus this morning? Would you give in worship? Would you give in obedience? Um, as you know, a portion of every week's offering through this pandemic, we are giving to ministries and organizations in our community around the world that are serving on the front lines and doing um, ministry to be able to bless um, the people around them. And so because of your giving, we've been able to give almost thirteen to fourteen thousand um, dollars away over the last month, month and a half to or two months to different organizations, different ministries. And so I want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your giving. Um, we want to continue to do that. We know that we have been blessed to be a blessing so that others can also experience the love of Jesus that we have experienced. And so would you prayerfully ask Jesus how he's calling you to give this morning? Would you be obedient? And would you give in worship to Jesus? The easiest way for you to give this morning is to text the word give to 972-808-5087. 972-808-5087. Why don't you take a moment, ask Jesus how he's calling you to give. Would you be obedient and give in worship to Jesus? Good morning, Law family. Thank you for joining us for the Sunday service. If this is your first time joining us, we'd love to be able to connect with you. And there's an easy way to do that. You can text LOT to 33777. That's two threes and three sevens. Hey, Law City, some more announcements coming at you. Sam has asked me to remind you guys to fill out our check-in survey. In case you don't know what a check-in survey is, it's just a quick survey to see how our leadership team can better serve you guys. And here's the thing. Don't be afraid to be brutally honest in those things. You can say things like, hmm, I wish Sam was a Cowboys fan instead of a Philadelphia Eagles fan. Or you can say things like, sometimes I wish Sam maybe kept his sermons a little bit shorter. You know, just things like that. But the thing is, be sure to fill out those surveys. Tired? Bored? Want to meet new people? Well, now you can. Be sure to join our Facebook community group. At the same time, if you haven't met, if you haven't made a Meet the Law Family Profile page, you definitely should. And the way you can do that is contacting Katie Evans. You can contact her at Katie at LawCityChurch.com. Again, that's Katie at LawCityChurch.com. After the service, be sure to join our Zoom call to discuss a sermon and any other questions that you might have, or if you have any prayer requests too. Have a prayer request? Be sure to email at prayer at loftcitychurch.com. And last but not least, if you're interested in doing announcements like me and you're like, hmm, I want to be as cool as that guy Calvin, you can. Be sure to email at info at loftcitychurch.com. We're always looking for volunteers.
you know, in times like this, it's very easy for us to speak and not listen. And one of the things that God has called us to do is to listen. And so I'm grateful this morning for a dear friend and brother who will be sharing God's word with us this morning. My friend Sean Watkins has been a dear friend of mine for almost the last decade. Um, I met him about 10 years ago when we were introduced through some mutual cases, and we have maintained a relationship since then. Um, And he has been an encourager, a supporter, and been someone I have often listened to and um, sought counsel on, especially when it comes to issues of race and injustice and reconciliation. And he spoke at our church about two years ago, and his message resonated with me in many, many ways that um, last week I asked him to speak, and he graciously accepted. Sean served on staff with university at University of Texas for many years, um, was involved in many, many conversations at UT, um, both at the UT level and on the national level with university. And then Um, Recently, God has led him to plant a church in Austin, and he is leading that church. And we're grateful for our brother to be able to be a part of this conversation, grateful that he um, has taken the time to speak to us. Um, And so I kind of invite you, as you listen this morning, would you listen, not trying to critique or condemn anything that you hear, but would you listen with open hearts, open minds, and listening, hey, God, what are you saying to me in this? And also, I'm grateful that Sean is going to be with us on our Zoom call after service today. And so after service, would you jump on the Zoom call and you're welcome to ask him any questions you want about these topics that you've heard, um, the, the sermon that you've heard this morning, um, but also questions about just what's going on in our nation, our community. And so uh, as soon as the Zoom call, as soon as the service is done, we'll plan for to meet right about 12 and spend some time together, ask some questions and pray together. And so join us on the Zoom call. But As we hear God's word, would you allow God to speak to you? Would you allow God to challenge you? Would you allow God to stretch you? Would you allow God to cause you to say, God, what are you calling me to do? And so would you perfectly hear from our brother this morning? Well, good morning, Loft City Church. I'm Sean Watkins, and I want to thank you for inviting me to share a word to your congregation on this Sunday morning. A special thanks to Pastor Sam for reaching out in the midst of all that's going on and for trusting that the Lord has put me on your heart to be able to share a word to this community. So thank you very much, my brother and my friend. Once COVID is done, we will give a a real hug and not just a social distancing one. Uh, Like you, sisters and brothers, I have been shocked at the recent events that have taken place in our country. In the midst of a global pandemic that's affecting nations around the world, we have seen yet again the visceral realities, one of the ways in which sin has manifested itself in our world. And that's the ways in which we other some another culture or another group, specifically with respect to racism and injustice in our country, and more specifically with respect to the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and most recently, George Floyd, and the ways in which that has ignited a revolution and calls for justice and a review of police brutality and police policy in the United States of America. And so as we wrestle with what does it mean for us to be the people of God, I think there's a specific word for us as a community of faith on this Sunday morning as the global body of Christ. And so I invite you to join in and to look at the scriptures with me. Let's see what God would have for us this Sunday morning. If you've got a Bible this morning, there are two passages in particular that I want us to be able to look at. Sure. Micah 6 and verse 8. And here's what that text says. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The second passage comes from Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12. It simply says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is the wellspring of life. My friends, this Sunday morning, I want to preach briefly on the subject, Black Rage and the Call of Justice. Let's pray. God who is living, thank you for the gift and the opportunity to be able to gather together as a community of faith. Thanks for the gift of technology, which enables us to meet from hundreds of miles across. And even in the midst of a global pandemic, that we can gather together as two or three gathered in your name recognizing that you are here in the midst. Lord, would you speak this Sunday morning as we need to not hear just another sermon. Lord, we truly need to have an encounter with you. Lord, you know the cries and concerns of your people. God, you know the burdens of our hearts and the distractions of our minds. So God, would you gather our scattered thoughts? Lord, would you bring us to a place of attention and focus on you? 
And Lord, I pray that this Sunday morning you would speak for your servants are listening. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin talking about this idea of black rage and the call of justice, I think it's important for us to begin with the basics. Specifically, what is justice? I'm glad you asked. It's a fantastic question. Webster's Dictionary defines justice as the administration of law, especially the establishment or determination of rights according to the rules of law or equity, the quality of being just, impartial, or fair, the principle or ideal of just dealing or right action. And so we intuitively have some sense of what justice means, but who are the enforcers of justice in our society? We recognize them as police officers, as lawyers, as judges, and as elected officials of local, state, and federal government as they help us establish both local, state, national, and international laws to ensure that justice and equality are promoted around the world. However, you don't have to be on the earth for very long before we discover that there is a broken system in America when it comes to dealing with and enforcing justice in our society. First of all, that justice has failed individuals. Part of the reasons why we're even gathering on this Sunday morning is the realities of what's taking place in our country. In the last decade, we have seen a number of unarmed murders of black and brown citizens at the hands of law enforcement or armed citizens themselves, and that's taking place without consequence or minimal consequences, and the statistics are staggering. From Trayvon Martin to Jordan Davis, Renisha McBride and Eric Garner. Uh, Tamir Rice, John Crawford, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Botham John, Ayanna Jones, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. The list goes on and on and on. It's failed us not only individually, but it's also failed systemically and structurally. And what I mean by that is it's failed us across race and ethnicity lines. Uh, African Americans make up 13% of the United States population, but we make up 15% of the prison population. Michelle Alexander talks about this in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And she produces staggering statistics and information that reveal the over-policing of predominantly African-American and Latino or Latinx communities. Brian Stevenson also talks about this masterfully in his book, Just Mercy, where he, as a criminal and civil rights attorney, reviews the cases that he is, the landmark cases in which he has brought about justice to African Americans who have been wrongly from convicted for crimes that they have not committed. As a matter of fact, Texas Monthly did a story 12 years ago featuring 37 men who had spent a combined 525 years in prison for crimes they had not committed. I'll say it again. Texas Monthly did a story 12 years ago featuring 37 men that spent a combined 525 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. So, when we talk about it failing across systemic and structural lines, we mean that it's failed us across race and ethnicity lines from marginalized peoples, but it's also failed us across socioeconomic lines. And what I mean by that is our prison complex, when we look at the data and the statistics, it doesn't just reveal to us that we have predominantly black and brown people in prison. We also have people in prison predominantly who come from lower socioeconomic status. And the fact still remains that if you have enough money, you can avoid prison time as compared to someone who does not have a lot of money, who comes from a lower economic background, and they're not able to afford a, a high-paying attorney that can help them uh, escape some of the possible prosecution they may have to endure. Michelle Alexander talks about this again in her book, The New Jim Crow. She said, more often than not, those without the capital get the punishment. We have a capital punishment society, but if you've got capital, more often than not, you can avoid punishment in the United States. And so as we look at this contamination of justice in our society, or this perceived contamination of justice, the question automatically becomes, well, who defines justice? Who determines what is right and what is wrong? We as a society have come together and say that we've got a collection of ethics and values in which we want to be able to live accordingly. But how is it possible that you can have one dominant culture that says we've got to have law and order and you have subdominant or minority groups that are saying this is not fair, this is not right, this is not justice? How do we determine what is right and what is fair? Again, fantastic questions. Loft City Church, y'all are doing a great job this Sunday morning asking questions. 
These discrepancies are often referred to as the justice paradox. On the one hand, we have a strong intuitive sense of what justice is, and we demand justice even now. We instinctively know when it's been violated, but what is obvious to one person or one group may not be obvious to others. People may agree what justice is fundamentally in our society, but we frequently disagree on how that principle translates into practice. And that, my friend, is where we move into part one of this message, and that is black rage. James Baldwin said years ago, to be black in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of rage almost all of the time. Now, when I think about rage, the first thing that comes to my mind is The Incredible Hulk from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you've seen that first Avengers movie that came out in 2012, Bruce Banner stands up in front of all of the Avengers and says, Cap, that's my secret. I'm always angry. They're wondering how this incredible powerhouse of a superhero can be contained so easily in the mild, meek-mannered physique of Bruce Banner. And he ultimately reveals his secret, that he can contain the super-powerful, limitless strength-containing Incredible Hulk because he walks around angry all of the time, and he can flip at a moment's notice. And James Baldwin says, in some respects, to be black in America and to be socially conscious is to walk around really with this thin veneer, this undercurrent of rage boiling beneath us for a number of reasons. As marginalized peoples, as African Americans, we experience that rage first and foremost for personal reasons. We have our own stories of systemic and structural injustice. Uh, As old black folks used to tell you, baby, I'm not telling you about the book I read, I'm telling you about the one I wrote. We have lived experiences that are traumatizing and difficult for us to be able to discuss. My mother has talked about the Ku Klux Klan coming to her house when she was a child growing up in Crockett, Texas. She's told me stories that her mother, my grandmother's, passed on to her. She's told me stories from my great-grandmother. And so I've got uh, stories that are passed down from my family, but I've also got my own personal experiences as well. A police officer pulled his gun on me my first day on campus as a freshman at the University of Texas at Austin. He thought that I was robbing my right, my white roommate of his bicycle. And so the police officer came upon us, withdrew his gun, asked what was going on, had one hand extended and the other uh, hand was on his firearm. I put both my hands up. My white roommate indicated to the police officer that I was not robbing him, that even though we were at the front of Jester Dormitory, Our dorm room was actually in the back of the dorm, and so he was moving his bicycle. The police officer checked my student ID, and once my roommate confirmed that I was actually a student, the police officer holstered his weapon and left. He didn't check my white roommate's badge, or excuse me, his ID. Uh, He checked mine and then left very promptly. A number of African Americans have those types of stories and examples before. And so when it comes to this undercurrent of rage, they're what sociologists call microaggressions. They're one instance by itself. It may not mean like much, but if they continue to build concurrently over the course of one's life, there's a level of rage that begins to build inside of us. And so we experience this rage first and foremost from a personal standpoint, but it also comes from a familial standpoint. I told you about my mother's stories and my grandmother's stories and my great-grandmother's stories. And I have cousins and family members and friends. They know what it is like to be followed in malls and to be stopped frequently by law enforcement. Um, This happens more often than not, sadly, too frequently in our society. And so when you talk to African Americans about their experience in the United States, you don't have to go very far. We don't need to look at the data and the research to tell us something that we already know by lived experience. And so you've got a familial, it comes from a familial perspective, it comes from a personal perspective, but then also it comes generationally as well too. We all remember every black person that I know can tell you specifically what elementary grade they were in when they first discovered slavery in the United States. I was in the fifth grade and I will never forget it as long as I live. And it does something to you when you recognize that you are the descendants of people who came here enslaved, that when you see a 12-year-old boy as Tamir Rice is killed in an instant by a police officer because he, a 12-year-old boy is perceived as a threat. And then we turn around and we learn about stories like uh, Reese Taylor and her assault or Emmett Teal, what happened decades ago. And we realize that there is a line that can be connected from the ways in which African-Americans were first brought to this country to segregation and mass lynchings that took place in our nation, to the civil rights movement, to mass incarceration, to the over-policing of black and brown communities today. That there is a social stigma attached to our ethnic identity that we are automatically, by implicit bias, deemed as unsafe, as dangerous to the community, 
as menaces to society, if you will. And so this, as a personal level, as a familial level, as a generational level, it begins to build. Those microaggressions begin to build time and time and time again. And they produce a level of rage that exists in the black community. And part of that rage is pouring out into the streets right now as we look at what's going on again with the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Now, let me be clear. Black rage, as is true in all cultures, manifests itself in constructive and in destructive ways. It manifests itself in constructive ways in the ways in which people engage in peaceful protests, or they start nonprofits, or they become involved in law enforcement, or they become educators, or they become cross cultural diversity trainers like myself, or ministers of the gospel, where they actually want to see change transform our society. But sometimes it displays itself in destructive ways, and there is a monicum of examples of that. I won't go into those. All of us know what it's like to see the beautiful sides of our culture and also to see the negative sides of our culture. Before we move on, I think it's important to make a distinction between constructive rage and destructive rage. I think more often than not, when we look at what happens in the responses of social injustice by African Americans, more often than not, we're reduced to destructive rage alone. And that's not true. Uh, There's, again, constructive and destructive rage, but we also have to look beyond those outward experiences that are being manifested in the black community. What I mean by that is when we look at these issues, we have to look beyond them. Uh, Black people did not create slavery. They didn't create segregation. They didn't create lynchings or mass incarceration or the need for the Black Lives Matter movement because of systemic and structural racism in the United States. Those were created by other forces at work. Uh, And as Dr. King said years ago, a riot is the language of the unheard. And so I think it's important for us to look at everyone, both the constructive and the destructive ways in which rage manifests itself. We have to look at them in their proper context, that if you take away the injustice, you don't have the violence. Before we move on, there's a passage I want to be able to read into our hearing. And it comes from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 14 through 17. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, uh, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Whoever chooses to shun evil, to stand up for justice, then becomes a prey to the community. Next verse says, Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. You see, in that passage, we find out that Israel has become so corrupt, so contaminated with the idols of the surrounding nations, that truth, that justice, that righteousness and equity, these four pillars that are needed for a nation to be able to stand on, they've all been kicked out of the society. That truth and justice and righteousness and equity are nowhere to be found. Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson, when commenting on this text, said there's a moral traffic jam on the highway leading into the city. God has personified these four pillars on which a nation needs to be built, and they are not in the city. They have been kicked out. As shocking as that is, the remaining parts of those verses, uh, 16 and 17, is equally troubling. That the Lord looks down in all of holy Israel, and he cannot find a single person within the community of faith, within the community of God, that is willing to stand up for justice. Sisters and brothers, that should not have been in the case in the Old Testament and may it not be said of us in this generation. And so if part one of this message is about the realities of black rage, then what is the church to do? How is the church to engage? How is the church to respond to that rage that we see happening within the African American community and cross culturally with our brothers and sisters? I think the church only has one response, and that is to answer that response with the call of justice. Remember, Micah 6 and 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. As Christians, we don't define justice the way in which America does or the way in which the West does or the way in which the world does. We define justice according to the word of God. The Bible is not written from a Western perspective. It is not a glossary with terms defined. It is an art gallery where the Lord hangs pictures of the ways in which the kingdom of God is supposed to look and be. And so there's no clear definition of justice in the Bible. 
The main principle that we want to be able to take away from justice from scripture is that it's not just dictated, it is demonstrated. Uh, particularly in two major events in scripture, number one being the Exodus and God's rescue of his people from bondage, Egyptian bondage and slavery, but the second in the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is on a mission of justice. This word justice in Hebrew means mishpat. It's typically defined as divinely righteous action, whether taken by humanity or God, that promotes equality among humanity. And so we see throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament that justice is an attribute of God and it is illustrated, it is lived out by the Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus confronts the social, economic, and systemic injustice in the Gospels. He heals the sick. He feeds the hungry. He delivers the demonized. He challenges dominant systems of exclusion and oppression. And he's a champion of nonviolence. And sisters and brothers, the church must be the same. Let me close with this. I want to give you six practical things that the church can do in terms of how to be able to engage with the times right now. And all six of these suggestions come from the little book on biblical justice by Chris Marshall. First and foremost, uh, the church must be an object of hope. The church must be an object of hope. Biblical hope, that confident expectation of a better future, is rooted in the knowledge of God's justice and his faithfulness. Our justice is not rooted in Webster's Dictionary. Our justice is not rooted in the definitions that come from our politicians or from our pastors. Our definition of justice is rooted in who God is. And so the outworking of justice in our lives and in our community is directly tied to the depths of intimacy in which we engage with the Lord and our walk with him individually and collectively as a church. Let me be clear. The church cannot be an object of hope to the world if we are not embodying this type of justice ourselves. And so we have got to make sure that we do a litmus test for justice in our own communities. And I'll share more about what it looks like momentarily. But we have got to be an object of hope for the world. That's the number one way in which uh, the church can respond to the rage that is existing and the protests that are going on in our country right now. They should look at the church and the church should out protest them. The church should be the biggest advocates for justice. Second, the church needs to have a primary obligation for justice. Justice requires commitment and struggle. Like any healthy marriage, I've heard most men say that the key to a happy life is a happy wife. And one of the ways in which your wife is happy is that you continue to date her even after you get married. Marriage takes hard work. It takes discipline. Uh, the commitment to go to work every day, the commitment to go to college and to graduate, to go to school and to graduate. You cannot be lackadaisical with those things. They require intentionality and focus and dedication of time and energy and your best mental resources. And friends, in the same way, that same type of energy is required for justice as well. Justice is not a pin the tail on the donkey type of scenario. Justice is not an idea that we teach on once a, a Sunday during Black History Month or one Sunday or a couple of Sundays throughout the year. Justice must be an obligation that the church lives out every single day. It must become a part of the DNA of who we are as a community of faith. But the church also must have a commitment to action. What we see in that passage that I read from Isaiah 59 is that the Lord does not stand by in the face of injustice. The Bible says in Exodus that he came down and heard the suffering that was going on for his people, and he sent Moses to rescue them. That God in the face of injustice does not just sit back and wait calmly and patiently. No, God is active. He is working in the minds and hearts of people. It may take time for that justice to materialize, but when God moves, he moves and he breaks that yoke of injustice in the name of Jesus. And that church must have the same mindset. We cannot sit idly by in the face of injustice and do nothing and be apathetic. We must have a strategic call to action because that's what the Lord demands of us. Justice also must be a relational reality. You see, if justice is a personal attribute of God, and if human beings are made in God's image, which we are, then we're called to emulate God's justice in the way in which we live with one another in community. That means that justice is all about relationships. We cannot say that we are in cross-cultural relationship with each other and witness injustice to one person and say that, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, I don't like to use scripture to illustrate scripture, but in this case, I think it's pertinent. Uh, one example of this, I think, is found in the Old Testament. 
In the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 1, the Bible says that Nehemiah's brothers come to visit him, and Nehemiah inquires about the Jewish remnant, those that have survived the exile and have made it back home safely to the Holy Land. And Nehemiah's brother tells him that those that survived are in great trouble and disgrace because the walls are down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And what that simply means is the people may be okay, but if the city is not okay, then the people are not safe. That there's a direct correlation to the community. The individuals in the community are connected. It's not enough that they have survived the exile. If the city is not safe, then the people are not safe. And justice has that same attribute. If one brother is threatened with injustice, then we all are threatened with injustice. Dr. King said it best. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that's the type of mindset that we have to be able to have. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. And so justice has a relational component. Now we get into the nitty gritty. Now, what exactly does that look like practically? Again, fantastic question. What we see in scripture is that uh, justice has a partiality for the marginalized. And what I mean by that is we see justice universally, that God is unchanging, and that there are, for example, the Ten Commandments. Those are universal, right? The ways in which God has called us to be able to live in community. But what we also see is another uh, practical way in which justice is lived out. That it's not just universal, but it's also subjective. And what I mean by that is when God says, hey, make sure you're doing justice in the community, he asks or he mentions these marginalized people groups, the immigrant, the orphan, the widow. Right? We want to be able to recognize who are the people who are marginalized, who are less than, who are the ones that because of systems and structures, powers and principalities, and just overall sin in our lives and in our communities, who are the people that will have less access to resources, that have a less than likely possibility of being treated fairly in our society? God says we must look to them and ask the question, not are we doing fair by the ones who have power, are we doing fair by the ones who don't have power? Would widows say that we are doing right by them? Would the orphans say that we are advocating for them, that they have justice? Would immigrants say that, yes, we have been just and fair and impartial? God has a universal definition of justice, but he asks the margins to define what that justice is. And so when the church does the outer working of justice, we've got to ask the marginalized. In this case, our black and brown brothers and sisters, those who are protesting right now because over-policing and mass incarceration and the frequency of unarmed shootings of these communities, what does justice look like? And finally, justice must have a restorative reality. And this may be a bit controversial, but I stand by it because I think it's biblical and true. That the conclusion of our protests right now cannot simply be uh, the firing of every single police officer that exists in the United States and the rebuilding of those communities. There are some places in which that needs to happen, where we've seen the statistics that show more than 90 percent of tickets that are given out are given out to marginalized communities. That's the case in Ferguson, Michigan, where Michael Brown was killed a number of years ago. The Department of Justice report revealed that. And so there are some places in which, yes, the entire system of law enforcement is corrupt and it needs to be eradicated. And we need to have new police officers with new training and new systems and new managers and new directors and sheriffs to ensure that justice is done for all. But what do we do with those people? In the United States of America and in the West, we are trained professionals at what? Punitive justice. We define justice as punishment. That someone can be arrested, they can be tried and convicted and put in jail. But that's not just how God defines justice. God has punitive justice without question, that we need to be punished for our actions. But more than that, God has restorative justice, that the ultimate goal is that what? Punishment would bring about repentance. And so what does it mean for us to invite um, police officers or former police officers who want to be able to change? How do we create cities of refuge for them where they are welcomed into our communities? How do we take in the hurting, angry vitriolic and painfully frustrated African and African-American communities and say, you are welcome here. That yes, we will carry your burdens to the foot of the cross. We will listen to you. We will love on you. We will support you. We will advocate alongside you. And we trust that the tree, that the leaves on the tree as found in Revelation will be for the healing for the nations. And we also believe that some of that healing comes from being a part of the church right now. 
that justice has to have a restorative community. And I believe that the United States of America, the role that it's on right now, it cannot bring about restoration and reconciliation cross-culturally between the black and brown community and police officers. The only way that that reconciliation can happen is through the church. Oil and water do not mix. You have to have an emulsifier. You've got to add an egg to that thing to get some mayonnaise. And in the same way, America and its history have never really been able to reconcile with African Americans or with immigrants, the marginalized. We need to have an emulsifier. And that emulsifier, I believe, is the people of God. It is the church. It is the body of Christ. That's our job and our responsibility. Now, what does that mean for you? You can look at Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna McDonald and George Floyd, but the fact of the matter is some of those things are happening in your city right now. If you want to truly do the work of justice, Google racial incidents that are taking place in your city and in your zip code and in your community. You don't have to go very far to find these things, and you can be an advocate for justice right where you are. Let me close with this. Years ago, Washington Irving wrote a short story called Rip Van Winkle, And in it, of course, the main character, Rip Van Winkle, the story talks about the fact that he went to sleep for 20 years. Uh, Dr. King years ago said, the most striking thing about this story, though, is not that Rip Van Winkle slept for 20 years, but what he slept through. You see, when Rip Van Winkle goes into the inn and up into the mountains to go to sleep, there's a picture of King George III hanging up in the inn. When Rip Van Winkle comes back down 20 years later, it's a portrait of George Washington, the first president of the United States. The thing is, it's not just that Rip Van Winkle slept for 20 years, but what he slept through. He slept through a revolution. That there were war, there was a war that was fought that altered the course of human history, that altered the course of everyone he knew and the entire city around him, that altered economic and spiritual and militaristic uh, forces at work in the country, and he missed it. He slept through a revolution. Sisters and brothers, now is the time. The church must not just be woke, but the church must wake up to the reality of systemic and structural injustice. We cannot be quiet. We cannot be silent. We cannot be absent. We cannot be apathetic in the midst of our times right now. My community, the black community, is hurting, and we are crying out for justice. And as the Lord said to Moses, he has heard that cry. He has come down. He has seen. He is concerned. And he is sending you. He is sending us, the people of God, to be advocates of justice, to hear and see the realities of black rage, and to that the kingdom of God offers hope, offers solution, offers a better world than the one in which you've experienced. And one of the chief attributes of that world is justice and equality for all. Law City Church, we have work to do, and it is my hope and my prayer that God will work in and through you to accomplish his purposes on the earth. Until I see you face to face when COVID is over and we can have a legit hug or a Wakanda forever. Much love, take care, and God bless. So grateful for my brother and um, his voice in our generation. Again, let me remind you, if you're available, jump on the Zoom call after service today. Um, Ask questions. Let's process together. Let's pray together. Let's grow together so that we could be the church that God has called us to be, that we could be the prophetic voice in this generation that says, thus saith the Lord. And so, you know, as we wrestle through this, Sean will acknowledge, um, I will acknowledge, we don't have all the answers. These are hard conversations. These are difficult conversations. But we know that Jesus Christ was the ultimate victim of injustice, the innocent Son of God, was nailed to the cross for sinners like you and I, and that he will one day turn to right every wrong that has been done. That's our hope. And that's what we hope for even as we partake of the communion table. And so as we're about to go into communion, we not just rejoice in what Christ has done for us in the past, but we rejoice in the hope of what Christ has promised for the future, that because of his death and because of his burial and because of his resurrection, we have this glorious hope. This hope that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will one day make all things right. And while we wait for that day, we pray and we move and we act, saying, God, we want to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see justice take place on this earth because we want our earth to reflect one day what heaven would look like. 
And so we pray for that. We long for that. So as you take communion this morning, could you be reminded that Christ died for you, for your sins, so that you could be redeemed, rescued, and brought into the family of God. You are now a son, a daughter of Almighty God. You are redeemed, you are rescued, and you are now the representative of Jesus in our community. Would you be reminded of his glorious work on the cross on our behalf? As you take communion, would you celebrate that he redeemed you not because you were good and not because you were right or not because you were perfect, but he, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Would you celebrate that your salvation and your work isn't based on your performance, that it wasn't based on how well you do, but it's based on the glorious work of Jesus. So can I invite you to take communion, meditate on God's word, spend some time with Jesus. Let's celebrate. And here in a few moments, we will come and we will worship together. Thoughts about us so one by one would be too many to count, so we simply come and sing of your great love. So we sing, we lift our hands and sing. You are worthy of perfection. You're the radiance of all. Glory, let adoration fill this place. You hold everything together by the word of your immovable power. We sing a song of Treasure the hope, the bright and morning star. You are the lover of our souls, and you want our hearts to sing of your great love. So we sing, we lift our hands and sing. You are worthy of affection. You're the Oh, Lord. 
as we come to benediction i want to thank you for joining us and worshiping with us this morning as again a reminder that um, there are many many opportunities for us to connect this week take advantage of them join the zoom call after service come listen learn grow ask questions um, as our brother sean is on the conversation and willing to answer questions that we have we have community groups that gather throughout this week richardson you guys meet tonight Dallas County, Dallas Community Group, you guys meet on Wednesday night. Con County, our group meets on Saturday morning. Join one of these community groups. Hear from your brothers, sisters. Hear where they're growing. Hear where they're struggling. Pray, encourage one another. Kids, you guys have story time today at 2 for nursery. And then Kids Church on Friday at 3. And teens, you guys meet on Friday at um, 7. Kids, get involved in these conversations. There's times that we get together to pray whether it's before service or Monday morning at 7.30, Zoom calls, join in one of these prayer times. Pause. Go to Jesus. I'm again reminded that in a lot of these times, we're really, really quick to speak and talk and say stuff, but we're not really seeking Jesus in it. We, we know God wants to bless this conversation, but we're not slowing down and bringing our hearts, our worries, our brokenness to Jesus. And so... Join us in these prayer calls. There are times where we get to go back to Jesus and say, God, our hope, our trust, our dependence is on you. And so can I invite you and encourage you to do that? Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each of us now throughout this week until we gather again. May God's presence go before us and lead us. God bless you. We'll see you next week.